Hello, friends. Welcome to our weekly data talk, a show where we talk with data science leaders from around the world. Today, we're talking about exciting applications of computer vision across various industries. And we're super excited to have Matt Zeeler, who's the founder and CEO of Clarify, which is an artificial intelligence company that excels in visual recognition and solving real world problems for business. Matt, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thanks for having me. So can you kind of share with our data science community how you kind of started, um, where your love of data science came from, and kind of your academic journey? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I grew up in Canada in a small farm town, and I always got an appreciation for building things, uh, working with my dad and building a uh, garage and pouring concrete and stuff like that. So that's what triggered me to take engineering in undergrad. Uh, at University of Toronto. They have this program called Engineering Science, where the first two years you take every discipline of engineering, and oh, then wow. the last you you get to choose which option you want to specialize in. And so when I was deciding between options, I went for advice to the resident advisor, and he happened to be one of Jeff Hinton's PhD students. So Jeff is super famous in the field of AI. A lot of people call him the godfather of AI. And he was a UAT professor at the time. And his student showed me this video of a flame flickering. And he said it was completely generated by neural networks, which is a type of artificial intelligence. And I was blown away because I knew how to program, but there was no way I could write loops or functions or anything like that to generate a realistic video. So I had to learn more. And that took me into the computer option. I ended up taking Jeff Hinton's course in uh, third year and then did my undergrad thesis with Jeff which was quite the honor uh, to get to work with him. And since I was a kid and loved building, I knew um, I wanted to start a company someday. And now that I had a taste of machine learning, I didn't know enough to really uh, build my own company around it. So that's what inspired me to do a PhD. Uh, I came to NYU to focus on that and got to work with a couple more uh, experts in the field like Yann McCunn and, and Rob Fergus. Uh, so very fortunate to learn from some of the experts before starting Clarify uh, four years later. And so the time frames here are like 2005 to 2009 was my grad, 2009 to 2013 was my PhD. So wow. before this you know, huge explosion of AI today, uh, I got a taste of it very early on. That is so cool. And I, I love just hearing your, your background with farming, making things. So were you always kind of like a builder, like, tinkering with things? Yeah, and like my dad's not a farmer, my mom's not a farmer, uh, my dad's a doctor, my mom's a nurse, my brother's now a doctor, so my whole family was into medical. Wow. I actually did one year of pre-med, but what I didn't like about uh, some of the stuff you had to learn around bio and chemistry was it was a lot of memorization, whereas the physics and calculus was a lot of uh, tools that you could use to build and uh, that's what triggered me to shift into engineering. Oh, that's interesting. So um, like you said, you were very fortunate to um, be under amazing mentors in AI and machine learning um, who taught you a lot. Um, what was it about, because um, so many people will like, they'll finish like their master's degree and then like go off. Um, you wanted to pursue the PhD. What was it that, drew you to the PhD program? Yeah, and I skipped directly from bachelor's to PhD, so I didn't have an intermediate master's along the way. And uh, that was enticing. I wanted to you know, do the deep dive into research, which you get out of a PhD. And at NYU in particular, it worked out very good because they didn't have, or you didn't have to do as a student, you know, a full course load every year for three years. Uh, all you had to do was four courses for your entire PhD. And so I got those done in the first year, which mm. allowed me to focus even starting in the first year on research. And that's the most important part about doing a PhD is that focus on research, because if you think about it, you're expected to be innovating. And when you're innovating, that kind of by definition means the stuff that you would learn out of a textbook is already obsolete. Um, it's not <laughs> at the, written on paper. So uh, so having that opportunity to do the research was really valuable in my PhD. And what was your, um, 
like in, I'm not sure about the PhD program you were in, but did you have to write like a thesis? And what was that on? Yeah, I had to write a thesis, and it was on uh, hierarchical models for understanding images. So it was all focused on image understanding, and it was a we called it that kind of abstract term because it combined two approaches. One that people call uh, supervised learning, which is where your images have already been labeled by people uh, to contain dog, cat, tree, whatever it might be. And then another branch, which is unsupervised learning, which is where you're trying to learn directly from just the pixels. And uh, there's no labels provided by humans. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, and uh, that is much difficult, more difficult problem because there is no context. It has to learn it all on its own. And so um, I spent the first three years focused on that hard problem. And then as soon as I started working on uh, the, the more kind of constrained supervised learning, that's when I got really, really good results really quickly throughout 2013. And that became the basis for Clarify. That's awesome. What types of imagery or video were you analyzing back in grad school? So. So there's a few standard benchmarks. Uh, one of them, MNIST, which is really famous, uh, very old from 80s or 90s, I believe. Um, and it's handwritten digits. So the black background and the digits are in white. So it's kind of binary. And uh, then there's an extension of that to color regular images called CPAR10. Both of those data sets are very small images, which means you can train smaller models and do experiments much faster. So that's really helpful when you have a new uh, moonshot idea and you have no idea if it's going to work. You can get feedback on that very quickly. Uh, then some of the more serious data sets became uh, Caltech 101, which are regular sized images that you can you know, kind of see as a human, uh, all the details in. And then uh, the most important data set was ImageNet. Um, and that kind of revolutionized the whole field of AI really is because it was much, much bigger. We're talking about 1.2 million images in ImageNet versus 3,000 images wow. in Caltech 101. So orders of magnitude bigger. And that forced people to do a couple of things. One was train much bigger models to be able to learn from all that extra information and to really, really optimize the frameworks we were using to be able to train much bigger models on much more data. And that's where things like graphics cards became the standard. Uh, there was no way you could do that type of heavy lifting with regular processors that we have in our computers. You needed to use the, the equipment that's normally meant for video games to start tackling these bigger machine learning problems. You know, uh, so today we're talking about how um, there are so many different applications for vis computer vision across different industries. And I think it's interesting that both your dad and your brother are both doctors in the medical field. And I've been reading articles about how machine learning and computer vision are drastically like helping doctors, uh, you know, find things like cancer within, within uh, MRI scans faster. Can you talk, talk about like what, because it's just interesting to me that, you know, Seeing that your your dad and your brother are both in the medical field, you're you had a pre med interest originally. I'm kind of curious about your view of how computer vision is being used in the medical field today, even though that may not be your specialty right now. Yeah, um, I mean, we actually do have a customer in the medical space, and they're doing what I think is really important in medicine right now, which is innovating on the hardware side of things. Mm -hmm. They made a simple piece of hardware that actually goes on the you know, back of your cell phone. It's a little lens that allows doctors to see inside your ear. And now that replaces a piece of hardware that's you know, a uh, filing cabinet in size um, yeah. with your own cell phone. And it includes an app that lets a doctors diagnose a disease in a nice touch interface. And what that has done is now collect a bunch of data from doctors, from the experts that Clarify could use to train a model. And now that the model's trained, they are automating that process. And no longer does a doctor have to see every single patient. They can actually scale up that effort. And they're seeing incredible results on it. Oh. Now the, the most uh, exciting thing is that with Clarify's SDK, uh, now we have APIs in the cloud that we host and run for you 
but we also have an SDK that lets you run uh, disconnected from the internet. So now they can take oh. a cell with the, the device and go to part of the world and provide medical care, which is super exciting. Wow. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, to me more exciting than, you know, understanding MRIs and CAT scans, because those are like million dollar machines that has a room. Um, which are great, and I think there's going to be lots of advance, advances there, but um, they're not the scale type of applications that we love here at Clarify. That's so cool. So in the example of um, the product that you worked on um, to help doctors with um, looking into the ear and finding problems, and you had all this training data, how much like training data did you need before the model was like working for you? So in that particular case, there was 10 different diseases we were trying to uh, distinguish between. And the total set of images that were labeled was about 75,000. Wow. So was, um, and when you think of having the device in a doctor's hand, in many doctors' hands, their normal day-to-day -day seeing patients would collect 75,000 images pretty quickly. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so um, tell me about... Tell me about your company, Clarify. Um, this is something that, when did you start dreaming up this company? And can you talk about that journey to starting Clarify and then the work you're doing now and the companies you're helping? Yeah, for sure. So as I was doing my PhD and started working on these classification problems, uh, at the start of 2013, I started having some really good results. And the way I knew they were an accuracy measure that we normally track as we're doing experiments, but I built a simple demo where I could upload my own personal images or images from the web and throw them into the demo and look at the results back from the model, and they were actually useful. Uh, and this is the first time I saw computer vision actually be uh, meaningful and useful. And so that was kind of in the spring of 2013. I went back to Google for the second of two internships with Google Brain. And it was a great learning experience because I was their machine learning team uh, led by Jeff Dean. I, and I happened to be an intern directly under Jeff. So that was a great learning experience because uh, he's famous for scaling up a lot of the core infrastructure at Google. Uh, and he's now the head of Google AI. Um, so I learned a lot from him. But I actually ended up leaving that internship two weeks early to come back to New York and start working on Clarify. Mm. So I realized that the tech I had working at NYU was working better than what Google had internally. And Google at the time was already ahead of everybody else in terms of AI. So I knew there was an opportunity to get this technology out there directly to developers and, and enterprises to let them have access to this cutting edge technology uh, and not just let them. But, but, so, so that was what inspired Clarify and started working on it in August. Uh, Ended up getting a bunch of job offers from uh, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Apple because uh, they knew I was graduating soon, and um, and it was a tough decision because you know the, those companies are great. Companies, yeah, totally. Uh, great culture, and um, you'd be set up kind of risk free uh, with these offers that I had versus my childhood dream and technology I knew was working better than what they had. So. Uh, I followed my gut and officially incorporated in November of 2013. Uh, finished my PhD at the same time, got that done. And then there, this annual uh, competition around the ImageNet data set is held towards the end of each year. And uh, I submitted the results. I was training in my apartment to ImageNet of 2013. And about three weeks after incorporating, the results came out and Clarify won the top five places. In wow. The so it was a great way to kick off yeah. image recognition. Uh, and that triggered inbound interest from customers, investors, and that's what really got Clarify off the ground. That is so cool. So, so tell me about the different types of companies, industries uh, you've been working with uh, to help them with computer vision. Yeah, intentionally we're building a platform. We want everybody to get access to this technology in its rawest form. That's why we started with an API, and now over the years have evolved to also offer SDKs that people can embed directly into their mobile applications and uh, even into on-premise servers now. Um, and that lets us run the technology, um, but it doesn't really cover two important things, what verticals 
do uh, do we target, and what use cases are people going to find useful from this technology? And we've kind of learned those over the years. We've been very fortunate to build a platform first, and because of early press and interest from uh, key investors, uh, we've had a lot of inbound interest from customers that educated us a lot that they would provide uh, or find useful from our technology. And so one example of those is organization. And uh, companies like Trivago, for example, you see their um, hotel listing ads on TV all the time. Uh, they claim to have over 10 million hotels across the globe listed with Trivago. And each of those has many different images. And mm -hmm. so if you're planning your next vacation and you go to Trivago, maybe you want to find the hotel that has the best pools. So now that Clarify has processed those images, we've organized them by pool and ocean view or bedroom shots so that when you're planning that vacation, you can see and compare things much quicker. Um, so that was one kind of organization use case. Uh, on the visual search side of things, this is a new experience where people can uh, upload an image and find visually similar images. And we just launched with homes.com in the real estate space to offer visual oh. And uh, and so you can upload a picture of a house you like and then find ones that are listed for a sale that look similar. Um, and then an extension of visual search is now not just looking at that one image to find similar images, it's to look at kind of uh, a group of images or a history of images to mm. learn kind of what the user cares about, their preferences in the world, and recommend things that they might be interested in. And that's what West Elm is doing for mm. furniture shopping. Uh, and they did this really cool um, integration. You can Google and find it. It's called the uh, uh, Pinterest Style Finder uh, by West Elm. And so they let you take a Pinterest URL of a board that you know captures your interests, and you drop it into the West Elm Style Finder. And it takes all of those images and uh, processes them by Clarify. And you select kind of what uh, room in the home you're, you're shopping for, so like living room, for example. And then uh, you hit submit, and it comes back with products out of West Elm's catalog that you might be interested in buying. Um, so lots of fun stuff like that um, people are doing across the board and in different verticals. And that's why when we're thinking about you know, who we work with, we think about the use case rather than the vertical. What mm. is this actually being used for? Because that use case is usually present across all different verticals, or many different verticals at least. That sounds so cool. I, I definitely got to check out the West Elm um, Pinterest visual search recommendation engine. That sounds so cool. Um, I never even, even know that it even existed. Uh, we'll make sure to put it up on our blog. That, that is so awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, so, you know, a lot of times when we talk about computer vision or like kind of like the popular like stuff that's on the on the news is about um, how computer vision is being used in cars. And, you know, um, as we move towards, they're saying in the next, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, depending on how regulation goes and as cars, autonomous cars get better with computer vision, um, it seems like that's going to be the future. Um, what are your thoughts about and are you diving into um, computer vision with, with vehicles? Uh, unfortunately, we're not. We've decided uh, at a company level to not focus on that. We think there's a huge potential there. Um, don't get me wrong. I think it's one of the, the really concrete and, and powerful use cases of AI. And I think it's going to change the way we do transportation. But I do think there's a lot of competition in that space, more than any, probably because the, the outcome is very expensive. Um, I think there's so much competition that every car maker is going to have their own AI team trying to do this. There's new startups that uh, are all trying to even build cars, some of them, or offer some slice of that technology. And all of the tech giants are also uh, rumored to be building cars, including uh, Apple, for example. There's lots of rumors of them getting into the automobile space. So I think it's super crowded, um, but we're interested to, to take some of the early rides, at least. <laughs> um, so tell me about um, what excites you about the future of computer vision. Sorry. In the, oh, yeah. So, the yeah. I'm sorry. Um, what excites you about the future of computer vision and the work that you're doing right now? Yeah. I mean, just seeing what people can do on our platform is, is already exciting. And 
And that's why I love having the platform with raw APIs and making it super, super simple for people to build things. Um, and we talk about APIs a lot, but uh, we actually have user interfaces around them. So you can log into your web browser. And even if you're not a developer, know nothing about machine learning, you can upload images and teach it how to recognize mm. things that you care about. Uh, and some of the examples are, are things that we as a company would never dream up. Um, so one that I love talking about is at a hackathon, and we go to lots of hackathons to, to drum off these types of ideas. Uh, at a hackathon in 24 hours, uh, a team took uh, pictures from uh, social media that cover uh, shots related to baseball in some way. And then they trained a classifier on our platform to recognize whether a ball was being caught. In and then uh, based on all the pictures where balls were being caught, they looked at the GPS coordinates of those images. And then they created a heat map over the stadium to show you where the best place to sit is if you want to catch a baseball. And so. Oh, that is so that, cool. Yeah, it was something that, like, <laughs> it's very practical and we never would have dreamed up. Um, and that's where we love, you know, offering this technology out there to people. And so I think the next kind of future iteration of that is to start learning from more than just pixels, which has been our focus from the start, uh, largely because that's what I focused on in my PhD. But we see a big opportunity to start broadening understanding to text, to audio, and start fusing these understandings together. And we have some early uh, research results uh, indicating that that's going to be a really successful approach. Uh, you can understand different types of things relating text and imagery together, for example. And uh, a common use case I'd like to talk about with that is retail. Um, Every one of us has shopped online, and we do the usual, you know, type into the search bar to yeah. find a grid of, you know, products. But when you go into those products, you don't just look at the picture and then hit buy. You read the title, you read the description, user reviews, uh, you look at the price, of course. There's a lot of pieces of data that Clarify isn't looking at today, but we're excited to start learning about in the future to provide much more holistic understanding of the world. Um, so I think that that's where the future of, of your vision and AI more broadly is going to go. That's really cool. So um, can you give me like an example? So like I'm on Amazon, I'm kind of searching for something. And, um, you know, right now you're saying that the computer vision technology you're using is analyzing pixels of the imagery to determine what it is. Um, but now you're wanting to, you want to bring in other data sources like text, maybe audio to help um, the computer learn more about that image. Uh, so like in a shopping experience, how, how could um, bringing all these things together help the searcher or the shopper? So for example, if we wanted to recommend you products, um, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference if we just looked at the picture between you know one size versus the other, a small, medium, large t-shirt or something mm. like that. There's no way you can tell from the picture because it's probably the, the same picture used across all these products. But it's all obviously uh, in the metadata attached to that product. Uh, it very explicitly says the size. So very simple examples like that. Uh, we can learn from your previous purchases, you know, what size t-shirt and that in your style. Um, and that would combine multiple pieces of data to do that. Very cool. Matt, when you're looking to hire on people on your team, what what skills are you looking for? What personality types are important uh, for people that are looking to join Clarify? Yeah, I mean, we've got lots of different roles, um, but I think most relevant here is uh, the data science and machine learning uh, type of backgrounds. And so we actually have two teams at Clarify. So one is called the, the research team. One is called the applied machine learning team. Those are the two machine learning teams. And uh, research focuses on the problems we don't have solutions for today. And that's things like understanding text. Uh, that's a good example of a research problem. Um, whereas applied machine learning takes those solutions out of research and makes them production quality. That involves collecting more data, tuning final parameters, and then deploying them to production so customers can access them. And having that split is really good because uh, the research team is typically those with backgrounds in machine learning. They typically have PhDs in that. We've had a lot of success with masters and PhDs of you know math or biology or physics types of backgrounds that are excited to learn more about neural networks 
but do it in a more applied fashion. Um, so that's kind of the, the two kind of backgrounds we look for. In terms of looking at resumes more, more broadly, one thing I, I really love to see is stuff outside of academia or work mm -hmm. experience um, that you weren't forced to do, but you're good at, uh, because that shows that you have passion in something. And that, that's one of the, the key attributes of any uh, really successful worker here. It clarifies they're really passionate about what they're doing and they have that kind of inner fire and drive. And so that's something we kind of look for um, in, in their backgrounds. And then, you know, as a, as a piece of advice for more, more practical, if you're going through school still, so I think getting internships uh, really changed my career trajectory. Uh, learning from Google engineers and the whole process they have for engineering made me come back after the first internship and completely rewrite my research code base. Because I just became a much, and that made me more capable. There was no way I would be able to write the initial versions of Clarify without having done those internships. Mm. Well, you know, this brings us back to the beginning, and I, I found it so inspiring how you had this dream to start Clarify. You could have gone a very comfortable um, and fun learning route of going to, like you said, getting offers from Google, Apple, uh, Microsoft, which could offer you great pay, you'd be in a great company, great culture, you'd be learning from other people. Um, but in the back of your mind, you had this like drive to start your own company. And maybe there's someone listening to today's show who has that feeling. What was it that, uh, or what would you say to those people that are listening in who are like, you know, um, I have these offers to join these different companies but I want to start something new. Uh, do you have any advice or any encouragement for them on, especially just learning from the path you took? Yeah, I think a couple of things. Uh, find a mentor if you're starting your own company um, because there's a lot of things you just don't know. I knew nothing but research off the start mm. and that helps you in no way starting a company. Um, so <laughs> find a mentor who's done that before. and. The second piece of advice is make sure you actually want to start a company. You're not just excited about the technology because mm -hmm. as the company grows, you're not going to be writing code every day. You're not going to be developing the, the technology. You're going to be leading the team and inspiring them and motivating them to, to innovate and, and do all that stuff that you originally made. Um, so make sure you actually like the idea of building a company and having that type of role long term. What skills are important for somebody to be a good leader of a data science company, someone who's able to motivate, but also keep a highly productive culture? Yeah, it's a good question. I think any entrepreneur needs to be super uh, focused and organized. Because, um, for example, uh, there's so much communication and information happening every single day that if you don't write it down immediately mm. and have it in order, way where you'll find that information later, uh, it'll be gone. It'll No matter how smart you are, um, it'll be gone from your head five minutes later. <laughs> something. Um, so that's a key. Uh, just staying organized is super key. Um, and then I think, you know, a lot of the times leadership is, is uh, best done by leading by example. And in the early days, you'll have an opportunity to do a lot of the different functions of the company from doing the first sales calls to writing the first marketing website to every division of the company because there's nobody else but you, um, you'll have to do everything. So uh, taking that early on and making sure it's really high quality kind of sets the bar for anybody we're going to hire and, uh, and motivate to do things in the future. Nice. Um, well, Matt, thank you so much for being our guest in Data Talk. Learned a ton about Clarify. Um, for businesses that want to partner up or learn more about Clarify, um, where should they go? Clarify.com has everything, uh, including our blog, which has always new information. Awesome. So for those listening to the podcast, it's spelled C-L-A-R-I-F-A-I.com. So check out Clarify.com. And for those that want to uh, learn more about you and your work, where should they go, Matt? Um, I do have a personal site, MatthewZeeler.com as well, although uh, most of my uh, career now is Clarify, <laughs> so much more updated. <laughs>
Nice. Well, um, thank you so much for being part of Data Talk. Thank you for sharing your story, your advice for data scientists, and also for those that want to start up their own company. Um, it's been an honor having you as our guest and uh, looking forward to maybe chatting in the future. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for having me. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Have a good day. Bye-bye.